let's get started. Today's topic is about choosing your background, when you should choose it, how you should do it, some tips that will get you a little bit further than if you just wait to the last minute. Now, the one thing that breaks my heart, and I'll see it a couple times a year, and it'll be a beautifully hooked rug flung up over the back of a chair or a couch and a picture taken with the caption of all done with the hooking. I have no idea what to do for a background. What color do you recommend? Well, I always want to be helpful, so I'll look at it and there is virtually nothing, 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 nothing that will work with that rug. They use lights, they use mediums, they use darks, they used every color under the rainbow. There's nothing that is going to work for that background. It's one of those things where I think you need to choose the background first, even though you hook it last, right? Because you're gonna hook what's on top first. I do recommend that when you're hooking background, your second strip of wool, I'm gonna say that again slowly, your second strip of wool should be background. Now, why is that? It puts that background on the rug, and if, in your, if you're in one of my classes and I come walking around, I don't have to ask you every single time, what color did we decide on the background? <laughs> because I'll see it right there. You'll instantly know if the colors you're hooking are gonna work with that background because you're putting it around the motifs, right? You're also going to have less background to hook later because every strip of wool you hook today is one less strip you have to hook tomorrow. So it's just a really good idea because if it doesn't work out, you can make arrangements and find something new before you get too far down the path and you end up like that Facebook post and there's no background that will work with that particular rug. So general rule of thumb, if you've heard me talk about color planning or if you're in my online course called Practical Color Planning for Rug Hookers, it's open right now and you can enroll. Just go to howtorughook.com and click on the icon on the front page. It'll take you to a page with information about the course and at the very bottom, you can buy into it. Color planning is what we call it. It's really value planning, and that's how I teach it. I teach that you need to figure out the value. If you have the value right, and you have the direction of the hooking right, color is like extra icing on the cake. You could hook a pine tree in purple with the right values in the right direction, and it's gonna look like a pine tree, right? If you hook it in pine tree green, but you hook it in the wrong direction, it's not gonna look like a pine tree. If you don't use different values placed in the right way, it's not gonna look like a pine tree, even though the color is spot on perfect. So value and direction of hooking is what's important. But as far as decisions go, we need to decide on the background sooner rather than later. Now, there are times when you simply cannot choose a background. Maybe your wool stash is all at home, but you've got an idea of what you've got, so you can at least choose a value, right? So you can choose a dark, a medium, or a light, right? Because as long as you have those and you've got that information, then it doesn't really matter what you use, what color it, it is. Because if you choose dark, then for the motifs, you really can't hook any of the super dark wools that you have. If you choose light, you can't hook with any of the super light wools, right? So it's kind of the same way with the medium. Although I will tell you that a medium background is the hardest to use. It's not impossible but it is hard to use. Now let's turn this around another way. What if you looked at this from the standpoint of, I've got a small stash. 
what do I have mostly in my stash? Do I have mostly darks? Do I have mostly lights? Do I have mostly mediums? And then what you choose for a background should not be that because otherwise you're really cutting down. Okay, that was weird. I could have sworn that back door open. You're really cutting down on the choices that you have that you can use. And if you've got a smaller stash, that's a great way to sort of maximize the rules you do have. Use those for the motifs and then just find that one special or a set of something that will do what it needs to do for the background, right? So the color that you choose, once you figure out a value, the color that you choose is gonna be dependent on how do you want to describe this rug when it's done? Is it a green rug because it has a green background? Is it a red rug because it has a red background? Is it a brown rug? Okay, you can just choose and decide where you want to go with that. I typically, I've fallen into, some would call it a rut, but I've fallen into a very comfortable place where I use sort of a chocolate brown for most of my backgrounds. I absolutely love the way it looks. Oh, here it is, a little toolkit. That's sort of my default go-to background. I'll use this background for almost everything. The good news is, is it works really good with a lot of the wools that I have. So that's one reason for using it. I don't have to think about it, and I know I got a ton of it right? Because it's not just one wall, it's a whole bunch of other ones. But let me get to that in a minute. So if you can't decide on a color, consider going neutral. And neutral can be not just gray, like what we looked at a minute ago. It can be brown. It can be off-white. It can be like a camel or a tan, that kind of a color. Those are safe because they show off other colors really, really well. So they're a really safe choice um, for going that way. Uh, you could use one wool or you can mix them. Now, if you haven't figured it out, I like to mix. I rarely, I'm trying to think, maybe my first stair riser, I think was one wool. Um, it was the perfect wool, um, but it was one wool. Um, rarely can you find that where it'll be just as interesting with just one wool as it is with multiple wools. I like a lot of variety. So I'll mix. Now the advantage of mixing is if I've got a half yard of this, a quarter yard of this, a sixteenth of a yard of this, maybe two yards of that, if I put them all together and they go together, I've got myself a background for a large rug right? Where individually they might be unusable, but if they're together, then I can use them in a lot of different ways. Um, there's a psychological advantage to mixing in that I never ever worry about running out of wool, okay? Because I'm mixing so many wools that if I get towards the end and I got to bring something else in, there's so much going on that that new one is not going to make that much difference. And the background is not a solid color. It's kind of vibrating all by itself anyway. So to bring something else in is going to be perfectly fine. It's certainly more interesting to hook. There's nothing more boring than having to pull strip after strip after strip of background wall that is all the same as it has been. So you get a little bit of variation. So it keeps me going. I like it from that point of view. And you can mix solids and textures. Now textures can be a little bit tricky and I'll cover that in just a minute. So I'm getting a lot of questions coming in. So let me go back. I'm looking for double question marks, those of you who are doing that. Um, and then I'll answer those questions and then we'll, we'll be good. Andrea says, my abstract Indian rug background will be yellow. Main colors are vibrant. 
Do I choose just one yellow or would two shades work better? The background is only a small area around the symbols. Well, there is another trick that I like to use for backgrounds, and that's when I put the first row around each motif, the first row of background around each motif. And I'll do that in a slightly different color. So Andrea, in your instance, it might be kind of neat to use that yellow that might be too bright for a background. Use that as the first row of outline and then a little bit darker value is the actual fill. Okay, you're gonna use a lot of that first wool. So that technique is also a great way to stretch your resources. If you're using a wool and you don't think you have enough, then change the first row of background around every motif until either something that's slightly different in value or it's slightly different in color. It can be the same value. All these little techniques really will give you an interesting, I will, my favorite one that I use in my work a lot is I'll do a really dark around the motif and then I'll go to the lighter chocolate brown. And part of that is I have a lot of the black. I don't usually do a solid black background and that chocolate brown is hard to dye. So that's my precious wool. And so I want to stretch it. So that's what I'll do with that. Uh, let's see if there's any other question marks. Is the brown dyed or off the bolt? This one is dyed. These are, these are dyed, very long process. I have to dye like probably at least 20 yards. I usually do more. And it's all over different wool. Excuse me. I didn't put that on. I think I would have after the banker called, but I forgot. Um, I, I dye over many, many, many different wools. So th because they start out different, they end up different. And I'm doing them in multiple batches. And then I get them all on a table and then I put them together and I put them into bundles. And that's what I sell on my website. Heather says, so if you use a dark value for the background, you shouldn't use any dark values within the rug. Generally speaking, yes, because if you put two dark values together, they're going to disappear. So if, as long as you're comfortable with them disappearing, that's fine. And if you do a lighter one, like say it's a flower, you do a lighter one around the outside and you've got a really dark value for your background and you put a really dark center in it, a lot of times, instead of looking like the center of a flower, it looks like there's been a hole blown through the flower. So you gotta kind of be aware of that. So general rule of thumb, that is true. Do you have an example to show with a multiple color in background? This one, that's got many, many different colors. Although this one's not as varied as it often ends up. Let me see my other ones. Better. The other sitting over here. So this one has some colors in it, like right in through here, that I would call almost a dark pink. Might not show up quite that way on camera but there's quite a bit of variety. This little bit down through there, that would be green. It looks like there's some red, more reddish tones down and through there. Um, here's another one, kind of done the same way from the same sort of collection of wool. Um, so do you use multiple colors for a background if you are hooking a small piece? Well, you can't get a whole lot smaller than this, right? So, yes, I do. I do. Oh, and Sonia, who's used my dyed background, she says she loves the antique background. Okay, so let's get back. What was I working at? Okay, so how much wool do you need? If 
you are hooking a rug that's say 18 by 25. Now to run those numbers, and we can do that this way. To run these numbers, I am in the rug hooking journey, I'm in the basics class, and I'm in the page where it says, how much wool do I need for a motif? And I type in 18, 25, and my factor. How many layers do I need to hook a rug? Four is average for most people. And then when I calculate it, it comes out to 1,800 square inches of wool. And then I use this chart to find 1,800. And I need 15 sixteenths of a yard. Basically, I need a yard, but that's to hook it solid. So from there, you can make a judgment call looking at the pattern, and you can say, well, 50% of it is background. So you would need a half a yard, okay? And that's how you would calculate. The other way to calculate it without using a calculator like this would be to simply take the wool that you plan on using and fold it into four layers and then lay it on the rug and then usually you know there's like a center area that gets filled in with something else and you're going to kind of just guess and fill it in that way that's another way of figuring out how much wool you need and that's why I use my unit of measure here in the studio is a sixteenth of a yard which is one strip with one strip I can just take that, fold it into fours, and it's actually a piece about this big by about this big. I can actually take my fingers and go one, two, three, four, okay, and kind of get an idea of how many strips. Or I can take that one strip and just keep flipping it over and over across the rug, counting as I go, knowing that when I get to 16, that's a yard. And then I just continue on with it from that point of view. Okay. Another way to choose your background is to specifically shop for background wool, okay? Background wool is sort of its own category. There are some wools that are boring as all get out if you hook with them, but they're wonderful for backgrounds. So shop for certain backgrounds. Are there certain colors that you like? Um, I know I've seen a rug hooked by Rebecca Herb using this wool as her background, one of my current favorites, right? It is stunning, but she can't use this value of green for the leaves, right? So for leaves, she had to go to a darker value she had to go um, um, to something different than what this is because this made the background. But when you see a wool like this, you might not instantly think background. So how do you get to that point where you start to instantly think background? And that's by creating a texture sampler, okay? I teach this in the practical color planning for rug hookers. There's actually some the measurements of all these little things are in that course and it's basically a piece of wool sewn down flat and then a small bit of it hooked it will teach you forever what wool that looks like this even if it's a different color you'll know in your mind's eye what how that's going to hook up you'll become a better purchaser of wool so one thing that you might not consider. Okay, let's take a look at this wool. I'm going to unfold it so you can see it in all its glory. Now when you see this wool, you might look at it and go, oh it's pretty, but I don't know what to hook with it. You can hook anything you want with it. You just need to know what it's going to look like, right? So it is hooked on here. Well here it is. It is hooked on here right right here. So once you see that, depending on what my rug is, maybe that's a background. Okay, 
that could be a flower bed next to a house. But consider these unusual wools for background. And the way you know if they're gonna work is you hook them up in your texture sampler and then you'll know if they will work for you or not. Background wool should ideally, not always, but ideally, it should be a duller color rather than a bright color. Bright colors come forward, dull colors go back. If you want to play with temperature, um, things like yellow, orange, and red are warm colors. Warm colors come forward. Purples, blues, and certain greens go back. They're cool colors. So you can play with temperature. Um, I wouldn't get too bogged down on in that because it doesn't really matter if this particular wool is dull and cool. What matters is how is it compared to the rest of the wool you're using, okay? The wool that I use for a background could end up being somebody else's bright, okay? So it's all relative. So it's all in concert. You cannot do a color plan you cannot buy wool by buying the perfect pumpkin wool, the perfect grass wool, the perfect sky wool, the perfect fill in the blank wool. They won't work together. Yeah, they'll be close, it'll be close and you might get lucky. But what you want to do is to choose them all together. Because what is perfect on one rug with those wools is not perfect on your rug with these wools. So it's all about having the right set. And if the piece of wool you have has too big of a swing, maybe this beautiful orange plaid, we decide that we don't like how jumpy it is with all these different colors, but we like this sort of general feel, you could marry that piece of wool. Now, normally with marrying, you take two different pieces of wool and the dye from one and the dye from the other comes out in the pot, they mingle and they both get changed, right? You can do that with a single piece of wool. That's really great if you've got a nice dark texture that just happens to have an unfortunate bright white or bright yellow line. Simply marry it. It'll tone that right down and it'll go away and then it'll be a really nice thing to um, live in your background. Now, what have I forgotten to tell you? What are your questions? Because I've gotten to the end of my notes. Backgrounds, you guys are all good with backgrounds. What's the biggest problem you've ever had with a background? Usually it's running out, right? And then prevent that by not using just one wool. And then that way you'll have plenty. Or simply overbuy. It's one of those, how bad it hurts your pocketbook and how bad it hurts your soul when you don't have enough. Everybody has to balance that. When I am calculating quantities for students, I will say you need six. And what I mean to say is the minimum you need is six. What do you want to buy? That's what I should learn to say. Um, I had a student who would, I would tell her it needs four strips. She would always buy eight. If I told her three, she would buy six. She doubled everything. She had less pain in her pocketbook. She wanted that variety to sit on her shelf and she did not want any chance of running out. And that was her way of taking care of that. Heather is asking, she goes, on the sampler, what cut size are you using? Now I recommend that you use the cut size that you hook with the most. Mine is a seven for the most part. That's what I like to hook with. Now, quite frankly, there might be some eights in here, sevens, eights. I usually don't go smaller than that. If you go smaller, is this the one that, oh, this is the one. If you go smaller, 
with cut sizes, particularly on textures. Okay. Here is a texture hooked in a wide cut, uh, this one right here. And it looks the way I would expect it to look. Right here, I wish they were closer to each other. This one is that same texture. Now they don't quite look exactly the same. They're the same color, but they're gonna have different looks because there's not much of a loop there for that color to change. So it's really gonna change the way it looks. The smaller you go with a texture, the more it becomes a solid. Yes, Sonia, I did talk about choosing your background first. You definitely want that to be your biggest decision. Um, after the background, what comes next? Whatever your biggest motif is. So if you've got a floral, what's the biggest flower? Then do that. So many people do it the exact opposite. They skip step one and they're doing all these other decisions, but they don't know what that anchor is, what that background's going to be. Dara says, I used a gorgeous dark green that's great for leaves and grass, but as a background on a chair pad, it looked a bit too bright. Yeah, and that's going to be one of those other things. Because you're using a larger quantity of it, it's going to have a bigger impact. So sometimes on your texture sampler, you know, maybe a, one little one is not enough. I know there was one wool that I did two squares. It's probably not on this one. I have several of, well, here there's this one. I knew that this wool would not show up completely unless I hooked more of it. So I did two squares because it's got a lot of different things going on in it. So that's what you can do with wools that have a lot of stuff going on. Heather says, if you use the jigsaw line in the background, do you hook still from the motif out to the line or from the line to the motif? Um, neither, I guess. Um, and I might not understand what, exactly what you're asking, but let me do, let me set this up. If we have, I wish I had a different color marker. Um, let's do, a simple flower, a leaf, something like this, okay? And I would do one row of hooking all the way around the motif, right? Wherever that's going to go, all the way around everything, all the way down, that type of thing. Then when I do the jigsaw puzzle, I usually look for a point so this would be a good candidate. And I come out from that point and I do the little curly cues, big and small, you know, something like that. And then I simply hook the leftover space. It's not really a sense of hooking from one thing to the other because I'm hooking very randomly. I leave big holes in my background. I try to get like the jigsaw puzzle over the entire background. Um, again, if I need to bring something in, I can bring something in and it's not gonna all be in one section. So it's gonna work out really good that way. Jess says, sometimes I hook the center, center area of the background with what I've really chosen. <laughs> then I marry all the remaining strips, maybe with a gray or tan, and then hook the outer background, blends nicely. Yeah, that's a great strategy, yep. Perfect. Heather says, how much of one wool should I buy to start with? I am new to hooking and want to start building my stash. I would find out, and it's going to differ depending on who you're buying it from. Where's the best price point? Is there a price point? I will sell, like off of this piece, you can rip one strip. All my wool is notched like this. 
you can buy one strip. Now that's so that you don't have to buy, a lot of teachers sell quarter yards, a full quarter yard of a piece of wool when all you need is just a line of that color. Um, most, in my studio, it, the price breaks at a half a yard. It definitely goes down at a half, buying a half yard, which is the smallest unwashed piece you can buy, okay? This is considered washed, it's washed, it's labeled, it's prepared, it's on the back wall. It can be used for hooking instantly. It's the same price as um, over as over dyed textures, as spot dyes, as dyed wool. Then the stuff in these racks, these racks are off the bolt, and I will cut those in half, but that's the smallest I'll cut them but there's an actual extra dollar charge for me going through the trouble of cutting it in half, okay? So a yard is a good place to start if your finances can allow it. Um, buy as is textures rather than hand dyed wools because they're cheaper, often 50% cheaper. Um, it's just a difference of what you're looking with and what you like to hook with. Uh, Elizabeth says, can you exp expand on what you said? The background should be your second wool you hook. Yes. So if I'm hooking this guy, okay, and I hook the outline of this petal, okay, the very next strip, the second wool I hook with should be this background. And I'll go around it. So I hook the flower, and before I hook all the way around it, I'm gonna get a piece of that background next to it immediately. There's something about hooking two wools next to each other. It sort of lights up the rug, it makes it so much prettier, it helps you to stop looking at the backing because that backing if it's still there, can distort your color choices. Um, get that second piece, that second strip of wool hooked in as your background. Now, if you're in a workshop and you can't or don't want to hook the, the motifs because you haven't talked to the teacher yet, get out here and, and hook this crazy line for the background. You can do that day one. You can hook that crazy background line day one. Um, the trouble is once you pick out your motifs and you start hooking next to it, it might not work and you'll have to, you'd have to take it out. But yeah, I definitely um, get that background in as soon as I possibly can. Debbie says, do you write on the back of your sampler what the wool name is and where you purchased it? I don't. Um, I have a different system for keeping track of that. And when you're dealing with large quantities, you get to know these walls. <laughs> and so I can look at something and I can pretty much tell you, you know, what the number is, you know, if I still have it in stock. Um, but you could definitely do that. I was initially playing around with doing a grid where this would be like one, two, three, four, and then A, B, C, D. So you could go E2 is and look in a notebook and see what it was. You could do something like that. I don't know how you would write it on the back. Um, so that's what. Jess says, I should clarify. I save about half of the original background color. Marry other objects with something that works with the main background. It's just that whole blending and mixing things in. Um, and she says, and, and kind of speckles or mar marbles, I'm guessing, the rest of the background. Your background should not be your last choice. It should be the first choice, even if you hook it last. Although I don't recommend waiting until the very end to hook your background. I like to get my background, move that background up a little bit further. Um, I'm hooking on a little pencil pouch. Now I 
got worms all over the studio. I'm working on this little pencil pouch. I hook on it during the hook-ins, which there'll be another one tomorrow. So if you haven't been to one. Um, and what I've been messing with is these flowers, getting that kind of figured out, getting this background in so I can get a good sense of it. I haven't hooked this yet because I know what it's going to be. Okay, right? It's going to be a mirror image of what I've already gotten done. Um, so that'll be the last thing that I end up hooking, right? I don't have the boring stuff left at the very end. I just keep moving on. Now, if this had happened differently and, and I was in a state of mind where I didn't have the bandwidth to experiment with this stuff over here and I wanted to just hook, then I would have this available for hooking and I would probably get that done. But this is how most of my stuff ends up. I end up with the background completely done before I finish the main motifs. And it, for me, it works. Um, if I didn't do a background that way, I probably wouldn't have any rugs with backgrounds hooked. Just saying. I know myself good enough. So let me, t I had brought these out for putting things together. This is a bundle of my antique background and they vary. Um, this one's very closely, you know, it's got purples and blues and greens, but they're very similar in colors. I typically hook with the stuff that doesn't sell. And those are the bundles that have wide swings and there's a lot of var variety in them and, and quite different. That's what I hook with. Uh, mainly because it's left over. Somebody's got to hook with it, right? And then this is what I call my best beige bundle. And I use this for background. It has a recipe that comes with it that teaches you how to marry it so that it all becomes a little bit more similar. Because right now, looking at it, this white one is a little on the bright side compared to the rest of them, right? But you put them in a pot and you marry them, these calm right down and they do exactly what they're supposed to do. And then I pull these two out. As an example of, this is pretty and, and this could be used as a background with the right set of wools, okay? This one would probably be more reliable because it's duller. It's gonna go to the, um, it's gonna move into the background a little bit more than what this one does. This one's a little bit, not really bright, but it's more of a pure color and it's gonna come forward a little bit more. And then this one, just because I was over there pulling those, I saw these and I thought, oh, I gotta pull that one. This is one that you might not pick as a background, but this one makes an incredible, probably one of the only gray backgrounds I actually like, because from a distance, this is a gray wool and these little threads and when you see there's like green and red and blue and all different kinds of colors in there and it makes a really interesting really really interesting background sharon is saying is that a larger pattern for a pencil pouch not so much larger sharon it's that some of the patterns end here that one went all the, the hooking went all the way up so it's for the same pencil pouch. No difference. No difference. Okay. And just for, for those of you who might be new to my channel, this is a, a very small one. I, these are not available anymore. Uh, but this is the one that I use for my toolkit. Um, this particular one is not available. But I'm going to make this design available for the bigger size. And the instructions on how to do the pencil pouch purse, because ideally you put a handle on this and it becomes a, a purse. Um, that course is available on my website at howtorugcook.com. Jan is saying, what is that number? Probably the gray, I'm guessing. If not, Jan, you'll have to let me know. That is N070, N070. I don't know how much I have of that. You'll have to look at the 
inventory list on the page where you order that. Okay. Well, that looks like that's the end of the questions. Thank you so much for being here. And the next lesson, oops, is Friday, because today's Tuesday, right? <laughs> I have to look at my, my computer to be sure. The next one is Friday, and it is actually going to be the 3rd of July. Holy cow. So it's the first Friday of the month. It's completely question and answers. So I'm going to be relying heavily on you to ask questions. So show up with your questions and ask them. So Heather, I just gave that number. Um, it was it was N070. Elizabeth is saying, as a new hooker, does it get difficult to see the foundation holes as the remaining hookable area becomes smaller when you start hooking all around adding background? I hope I'm clear. Yes and no. First off, Elizabeth, you should not be looking at the holes. If you're counting holes, you're on a mission that is going to fail because you're gonna get a thicker wool or a thinner wool, or you're gonna go from one background to another, or backing to another backing, and the whole count's gonna be completely different. Do not count holes. You just stick that hook where you think it needs to go and pull it up. The only time I pay attention to the holes is when I'm hooking the exact outer edge of my rug, and I will hook that straight, it's the only thing I hook straight on the line generally, and I will, sometimes though, I actually do come in two rows, and then I'll draw a line and I'll pull that up in that pencil ditch. Um, so I guess I'm not really hooking on the line. I'm hooking two rows inside. But because of my vision, I can't always see that. So I will take a pencil and draw that line. And I'll just draw six inches while it's on my frame, hook it up, draw six inches more, hook it up, and uh, so on and so forth. So that's it, everybody. I'm counting on you for Friday, okay? Show up with your questions. Remember, double question mark, and you can add them at any time. If you've got a question and you know you can't be here on Friday, you can go over there and put that question in now, okay? Get your question in, and I will answer it. That's it. Thanks, everybody. Bye for now.